Okay, so this is the phrase, and I want to pick up the fact that a number of architects are now talking about empathy, and in particular some are talking about mirror neurons as being the neurological correlate of that. And I, I'm going to, uh, in particular today, look at the writings of two people. Harry Francis Mulgrave is himself an architect who in recent years has done a lot to open up the conversation between um, architecture and um, neuroscience. And then Vittorio Galesi is part of the group in the University of Parma who discovered the mirror neurons. And in recent years he's been engaged in trying to open up the science to discussion with the humanities with art and with, um, to a lesser extent, architecture. But Alessandra Gattara is a young architect who went on from his architecture practice to do his PhD with Galesi. And so this is their first paper together, Embodied Simulation, Aesthetics in Architecture, an Experimental Aesthetic Approach. So these occur within a book co-edited co by Sarah Robinson, Yohani Balasma, Mine in Architecture. And there's another little book in which both uh, Mulgrave and Galesi contribute from uh, Helsinki with contrib contributions not only by Mulgrave and Galesi, but also by uh, two editors, Sarah Robinson and Yuhani Balasma. Uh, so those two um, books between them provide the framework for what I want to talk about today. And so what I'm going to talk about is a mixture of exposition, critique, and trying to carry the story forward. So to look at their work, not in terms of they've got it right, but rather they've started an important conversation. How can we, how can we move that forward? So let me just, before we get into the specific topic, let's see how Harry Mulgrave framed it. Uh, he's saying we're developmental organisms raised within environmental fields. Um, he's then saying that architects are designing our built environments and so, to what extent then can our understanding of how the brain develops, how the person develops, um, enrich through a study of our biological complexity, our approach to architecture? And so he's advocating a synthesis. He wants to say there's the artistic component, if you will, the romantic component of architectural creativity, composition, good forms, but there are also the insights of neuroscience. And what he has singled out are the things that are going to provide the the challenge for today's discussion, emotion, empathy, and mirror neurons. And so I will be a little later getting into some detail about mirror neurons and how they relate to other systems in the brain. But, the, but first this notion of empathy, and, and I'm, I confess I'm going to have some problems with uh, the architectural view of empathy that goes back to Robert Fisher in 1873. He had the term Einfühlung which means literally feeling ourselves into, in, in this case, of whatever we're contemplating. Every work of art reveals itself to us as a person harmoniously feeling itself, himself into a kindred object, or as humanity objectifying itself in harmonious forms. I, I, I confess I have trouble with that formulation. Um, but we're going to try and see as we go along what we can get from this and what we can't. Now, this idea of feeling ourselves into an object of artistic com uh, contemplation um, leads to the English term empathy and with Galesi and Guitarra, Malgrave seems to make such empathy a primary concept for merging architecture and neuroscience. And feeling ourselves into, as here, is replaced by neurologically simulating objects of artistic contemplation with the notion that mirror neurons provide the key neuroscientific correlate. But this is already going to be a problem because um, mirror neurons respond to actions, not objects. So um, neurologically simulating an object of artistic contemplation is a little different perhaps from neurologically simulating the process of contemplation. And then the next point is if you're processing the contemplation, as it were, then are you really having empathy with the building or is it just the way you are responding to the building in qualities that do not involve uh, the, the, the sort of things that mirror neurons respond to? Uh, Harry Mulgrave goes back to Schopenhauer to give us a sense of how, in some sense, a, 
a process view uh, might inform our reaction to architecture. Schopenhauer said, um, the brain reads a building's forms as a conflict between gravity and rigidity. And so the architect's task is to devise an ingenious system of columns, etc., through which he derives, deprives those insatiable forces of gravity of the shortest path to their satisfaction. Now, if we look here um, at the Parthenon, then we, we can see this upper structure as, in some sense, uh, imposing gravity, and we can see the columns opposing it. Uh, if we turn around uh, through 180 degrees, um, then we'll see uh, another building where we have the caryatid. So you're really symbolizing the idea of people resisting uh, the weight of the building. So uh, there we, we can be inclined to agree with Schopenhauer. But another example that uh, Harry gives us is the Library of Celsus in Ephesus. And here, for me at least, there's no sense of the columns as bearing weight. The whole point about this, for me, is the grace of the design, the pattern, and so on. So it's the rhythm and, and the beauty of it that, that has its effect between, for me, rather than that, that resistance. But that's okay, because our point here, and I think Harry's point, is not to ask us to reduce our appreciation of architecture this, to this battle between gravity and rigidity, but rather to get the idea of here's an active process of resisting the force of gravity. And so that already gives us a dimension where you might imagine that mirror neurons, by saying I can look at somebody who's resisting a force, and here's a building whose design is resisting a force, that might give us the sort of thing that a mirror neuron structure could, could make sense of. Um, and as we go along and look, for example, at what Galazi and Guattara have to say, we are going to move to a situation in which uh, a lot of other human actions are implicated in terms of the appreciation of primarily works of art. They don't particularly get into the architecture, but the, the discussion becomes pertinent nonetheless. Okay, so let's go back to the Oxford English Dictionary, the source of all knowledge. Um, and uh, look at their definition of empathy. In fact, there are a large number of them, but look at this. This is sort of what empathy means, the power of projecting one's personality into and so fully comprehending the object of contemplation. Um, and the term was apparently introduced by, by Titchener in his lectures in experimental psychology, where he says, not only do I see gravity and modesty and pride, but I feel or act them in the mind's muscles. This is, I suppose, a simple case of empathy, if we may coin the term as a rendering of Ein Fühlen. And as we've already mentioned, many people say mirror neurons as providing the mind's muscles, if you will, of empathy. But my concern is that this is really not exhausting the aesthetic or the architectural experience. Um, let's go back to this idea. If we really think of projecting one's personality, in other times, I meet another person um, and in some sense, I see that they are in pain. And in some sense, I'm able to register that pain in my own body. And I may uh, have sympathy with the pain, or I, I may uh, have contempt for the pain, or I may, heaven forbid, uh, have pleasure in their pain. But at least, in some sense, by being able to map their bodily state onto my own, I can perhaps better interact with them than if I couldn't. That's, that's the basic claim. And I think it's a real neuroscientific question. If you, if, you, if you use the term empathy for a building, um, would it really make sense that the same brain mechanisms that can map another person's body onto your own body in some way to map the building onto you? I look at a church. In what sense does the church map onto my body? And, and a sort of general idea I would have is, for example, that there are awe-inspiring buildings. Now, you can imagine as a primitive part of the human condition, an almost innate part of the human condition, you see a mountain and your eyes are carried up to the top of the mountain. You feel awe for it. You're not mapping it onto your body. You're not feeling 3,000 meters tall. You're, you're perhaps, if anything, thinking of yourself as a... Uh, look at the cloudscape or 
imagine climbing to the top of that or imagine the view from the top of it and all those things combined to give you an experience that to my mind has nothing to do with mapping onto the bodies or the mind's muscles in terms of the way the building is. So the feeling into the building, the experience of the atmosphere of the building or the functionality of the building or the affordances of the building for me is um, in some cases can be related to empathy of the kind we feel for another human being. But my, my final point for this slide is when empathy is concerned in a way that perhaps Fisher or Mulgrave can appreciate and I can't, it's still an open question for the neuroscience is, is that the same empathy employing the same neural mechanisms as the one for our empathy for our fellow human beings? So, in a sense then, the question that I'm just making explicit on this slide is how central is empathy? Um, Verflin asks, how is it possible that architectural forms are able to evoke an emotion or a mood? Um, and and to, to reiterate what I've just been saying, it's not clear to me that, that empathy in the sense that relates to our empathy for another human being is going to exhaust the psychological processes. And therefore, it's not clear to me that mirror neurons exhaust the uh, neurological processes. Okay. Now, it's very common in these discussions to just talk about mirror neurons as, oh, mirror neurons allow us to experience the feelings of others and leave it at that. And it seems to me that my mission <laughs> is to say that, hey, you know, there's some real neuroscience out there. There are details about these neural systems. And if we're going to have a serious conversation between neuroscience and architecture, it's good to go both ways. Or putting this a different way, um, is the conversation only to be that architects want to talk about a little pop neuroscience, and maybe that will enliven their discourse? Or is there something in it for the neuroscientist? Are you going to say, hey, because we're thinking about the built environment, the challenges, not just of functionality, but of atmosphere and so on, there are new issues that could suggest new studies in neuroscience. Maybe some of them are brain imaging on humans. Maybe some of them even say these are underlying deep processes that we can establish with animal studies in the same way our understanding of mirror systems started with the discoveries of the Parma lab on, on the monkey brain. So uh, I um, am, amongst other things, a computational neuroscientist. I want to take those manifold data from different species, try to understand really how the brain works by looking at the processing underlying the, the phenomena of interest. So I'm going to try and give you a sense of that um, in the next few slides and hope that I can keep it at a level that architects will still find uh, of interest. But first, let me introduce the crowd of characters. This is from 1991, uh, a dinner in um, Japan uh, hosted by Hideo Sakata, who gave us a lot of insight into how the parietal lobe at the back of the brain provided processing of visual data appropriate to uh, the motor system. And here is Giacomo Rizzolatti, who led the group in Parma. But this is um, a year before mirror neurons were discovered. And at that time, his group had already charted the premotor cortex, where the, the neural instructions are being assembled for controlling hand movements. And so at that stage, we were talking about how might it be that the hand movements are compiled from visual experience of objects, what are their affordances, to come up with the motor program. And um, the other member here, Mark Genero, was the one who really got me into hand movements because he was the one who had observed that um, and looked at the human neuropsychology, both in normal people and with brain damage, of when you reach for an object, you're not simply moving the hand and then shaping the hand. In general, you coordinate the reach and the grasp. So there are already the affordances. There's both the affordance of location, saying, where do I want my hand to get, and the affordance for grasping, which may or, not be may, or may not be functional to say, OK, so I'm shaping the hand at the same time. So these provided the three ingredients on which uh, I assembled a great deal of modeling. And here is Madame Genereau, and here is Mrs. Arbu to complete the team. 
So let, let's get a little bit into the into the, the neuroscience here. So the important point is the discovery that um, vision has multiple pathways in the brain. And I'm just going to simplify it to two. If you go up to the parietal lobe and over to the motor area, we'll call that the dorsal pathway because uh, dorsal is the, like the dorsal fin of the shark. So you're going up over the top. Um, and alternatively, if you come down to the inferior part of the temporal lobe down here and then go up through the prefrontal cortex, sort of a strange name, prefrontal. You'd almost think, well, the frontal cortex should be the front of the cortex, and the prefrontal cortex should be out here in front of the forehead somewhere, but it's sort of the extreme front. And then back. So these are the two paths. And what happened, a generous group and another group, uh, Goodell and Milner, observed patients who had lesions for the path. So if somebody had a lesion here and could only use this pathway, and you gave them... Uh, something like you show them different, uh, different, let's say, cylinders. The point about a cylinder is it has no semantics about it, what its size should be. Um, so you just say to them, tell me, uh, show them one of the cylinders, how, how wide is it? They couldn't tell you. You say, well, pantomime for me how wide it is. They couldn't even pantomime the width. And then you say, pick it up. And let's say six different cylinders, there was a perfect correlation between the the, the width of the pre-shape and the, the diameter of the cylinder. So they could e extract the information for how to do a job, but they couldn't tell you what the cylinder was in terms of those characteristics. Conversely, a patient who had a lesion here and could only use this pathway could reliably report on the size, could even pantomime the size of the, of the object, but when reaching for it, she would just keep her hand at the maximal extension because she, the how pathway could not inform her hand how to pre-shape. And it was only when she hit the object that she would then use the sense of touch to enclose and successfully grasp it. So I think it's already interesting, um, in, in a way, what can neuroscience add to phenomenology? Phenomenology says, I, as an intact person, can do this, do that, experience this, experience that. It's interesting to know that even such things that from a, a, an introspective level are indivisible, in fact, are divisible when we look in terms of the brain. And I, I put it as an open question, not something I can answer today, but I put it as an open question. In the future, can architectural design be improved by understanding what these components are of how the brain contributes to our experience to maybe tweak the balance between different sub-processes in an experience? So that's the thought. So let, let's get serious a little bit about the neurophysiology. We're moving here to the, to the monkey brain. And here we are in an area called AIP. That just means this region is parietal cortex. Here's a sulcus, a groove pulled apart inside the parietal lobe. And so this is the anterior. It's the front area within the intraparietal sulcus, IP for intraparietal. So here's a particular little area in the brain. Uh, just for reference, this LIP, the lateral intraparietal sulcus, is where the, the map for eye movements is placed. So this is where the, the eye tells the cortex where a target is in the visual field to, to set up the information for a cicada, a rapid eye movement to that target. So that it's an interesting fact, just in passing, that there are different maps. Here's a map that appears to be specialized for where do you want the, the eyes uh, to move? What Sakata and his colleagues in Japan found was there's a map here that looks at objects in terms of what are the grasps to be, to be made. So if I have a small cube and a small sphere, then this pathway, the what pathway, is going to be able to recognize and say, yeah, that's a cube, that's a sphere. This pathway coming up, the dorsal pathway coming up through AIP, doesn't care what it is, it just says, oh, there's a small thing, I'm going to need a precision pinch. Okay, so that difference, again, we see between the how to grasp it using a precision pinch and the what, sphere versus cube. And uh, moving on from that, then Rizzolatti and, and the whole team in Parma, in Italy, um, showed that here you would have neurons whose firing would 
would differ depending upon the motor schema. The, if, the, if there was a, a neuron that might fire vigorously for a precision pinch, but not for a power grasp, or vice versa. Um, and I just noticed that in sort of our terminology, um, a, a thing about the brain seems to be there are many different affordances coded in different parts of the parietal lobe, and then there are different types of motor schemas setting up our motor programs in the frontal lobe. So I've, I've both gone into detail about the one for hand movements, hand, sh hand grasps, and mentioned in passing another one for going from, here's a target that in some sense affords an eye movement, talking to an area up here uh, in terms of um, controlling that eye movement. Okay, so here's where I get not into spelling out um, all the fine details of how we set up the model on the computer, but just giving you a sort of the high-level view of how we assemble uh, models of different parts of the brain and integrate them so that we can then set up parameters and say, okay, if we set the parameters this way, does the model work? If we set it up that way, how does it fail? Or how can we, we match different types of experimental situation? So here's the idea. If you look at this, the claim is that if we go up here on the dorsal stream, that's the how stream. It doesn't know what that object is. What it knows is, oh, if I analyze this, there are various ways I could grasp it. I could grasp it by the rim. I could grasp it by the handle. I could grasp it by a part of the rim, and so on. So here are the, the affordances that are available. Now, the ventral stream, on the other hand, recognizes it's a mug and reports this to prefrontal cortex and prefrontal cortex has access to things like working memory um, do I know that there's coffee left in the mug or not it has uh, influence from motivation um, do I need another shot of caffeine or not and so on that basis it, it could come up with a, a, a different situation. In one context, it might say, hey, I need to pick up the mug to get some coffee. In another situation, it might say, I need to pick up the mug because it's on top of some papers I need to consult. And so in one case, um, the prefrontal cortex, on the basis of those analyses, would inhibit, uh, let's say, this and this, so that this would take motor control if it's part of a program to move the mug out of the way. Whereas in the other scenario, uh, it would inhibit this and this so that the grasping of the handle would become part of the motor program. But the point is that this pathway, in some sense, on my analysis, is doing the planning. What at a high level of analysis has to be done? And this is the one that says, I will give you the, the fine parameters so that when you've decided what you want to do, we can plug in those so that you'll move the arm and the hand to the right place, you'll pre-shape appropriately, you'll carry out a skillful grasp. So, so this is just to give you some idea of, um, we haven't got to mirror neurons yet, but we're already getting the sense that, hey, there are a lot of different brain regions, even in this simple thing of reaching out to grab something, that have to be coordinated. And that if we're going to understand the brain, I think we have to go to at least this level of, of understanding the, the distributed computation in life. Okay, so, but uh, the star of the show, uh, Mirror Neurons, they were first, dis first published uh, a year after the, the dinner photo was taken um, with this team, um, Pellegrino, Fadiga, Fogasi, Galesi, and uh, Rizzolatti. And uh, these are the data. So, we're recording, we, I say they, probably Fogasi in this particular case, or Pellegrino, were recording from F5, and they, they found cells that responded in different ways. Now, one would be a cell that was tuned for, a, let's say, a precision pinch, another would be a cell tuned for a power grasp, and so on. And so here's the sort of study they were doing, right? The, the, this is what the pre-92 study, you would map the area in terms of how cells would be active when the monkey was doing the grasping. Now, one of the things about the lab setup is that the uh, electrodes are set up not only to an oscilloscope, but to a loudspeaker. And so one day, let's say it was uh, Leo Fagasi was placing um, a piece of food on the tray before passing the tray 
over to the monkey to record his response, and the loudspeaker went, Brrr, what the hell is going on? So here we see these are, these are individual traces of one, one instance, and we sum them to see um, histograms, and this shows this is a cell that fires very vigorously for the monkey carrying out a precision pinch, but pretty vigorously for seeing someone else, and so that was the first mirror neuron. And since then, it's been found that there are two kinds of neurons in F5, amongst others. The mirror neurons are those that are active both when the monkey does it and when the, the person or monkey being observed does it. But the canonical neurons are the ones that fire, in this case, when the monkey does it, but don't fire for observation. So I already want to make an important point um, that here we're seeing that the set of neurons active when you do it is not the same as the set of neurons active when you observe someone doing it. The, the mirror neurons are the overlap between those two different sets. So that's going to be a, an important point that we'll get to as we develop. Okay, here, here's another one of those models. Um, maybe a little too complicated for my own good, but the basic idea is forget about mirror neurons for the moment. You see an object, you reach for it, so one pathway has to say, where is the object? How do I program what the hand, what the arm does to get my hand to the object? And then there's this pathway that looks at it. What are the affordances? Um, which one am I going to act on? Uh, what motor program do I need? And so between them, we get the coordination of hand and arm in the successful grasp. And then the idea is that um, these mirror neurons over here are stimulated by the motor program. So uh, some neurons here are wired in such a way that uh, if you're carrying out, a, let's say, a precision pitch, they'll be stimulated by the, the side message, what we call the corollary discharge from, from here. But the neat thing then is that the brain is wired up not so that mirror neurons will respond to seeing you reach and grab something, but rather, over time, they can take information. How is the hand moving towards an object? And through the neuroplasticity, we'll come to say, oh, if I see this motion of a hand relative to, to the object, then um, I'll increase the strength of those synapses. So eventually, these uh, neurons can be activated without the side discharge from your own action but just by seeing that trajectory of the hand relative to the object. And that's when they become mirror neurons. So they start, so the idea is that there are lots of mirror neurons. That now there are mirror neurons for tearing paper. There are mirror neurons observed in monkeys for cracking peanuts, things that aren't innate. So there has to be a learning theory of how you go from basic connectivity that says when you develop skills, then uh, you can recognize it when other people are exercising the same skills. Now, one little notion that I don't know that I'll be able to or want to build on today, I'll probably come back to it in later weeks, is that notice that monkeys don't imitate worth diddly squat, and mirror neurons by themselves don't do imitation. They say, I've built up this ability to say that if I know what my hands are doing when I carry out a behavior, then I can recognize when somebody else moves their hands that way. Imitation is, is the opposite. It says, I don't know how to do something. I see somebody doing something that gives them a reward I'd like to have myself. How do I go in the opposite direction, mapping from the successful behavior of others to developing the skill to carry out that behavior myself? So that, that gets into, a, again, a whole lot of brain regions to do imitation that aren't here in our basic model. But we've already had two models with quite a few different brain regions working together to get us, how do we come to grasp objects successfully, both moving the arm and the hand, and then how do we come to recognize our own actions so in such a way that the ability to look at our own actions informs our ability to get to the actions of others. So in evolutionary terms, the suggestion is that the mirror neurons didn't evolve in the first place for social perception. They evolved in the first place just so we could keep track of our own behaviors, but fortunately they gave us the skill to track the behaviors of others, and so they became evolutionarily advantageous for social interaction. I'm going to give you one more example of modeling. 
which is intriguing to me at least because it looks as almost none of the literature in neuroscience does it looks at the role of mirror neurons in one's own behavior rather than the role of mirror neurons in social behavior so here's um, Bro Olstermark, a Swedish uh, neuroanatomist, a long time ago, around 1980, was interested in what are the connections um, from the, the spinal cord to different parts of the musculature. And he wanted to know if it was possible to find specific fibers coming out of the spinal cord that controlled the hand, or in this case, the paw of the cat, versus controlling the arm of the cat. And so here's a normal cat. Um, he was testing, to test the normal coordination of arm and paw, he placed food in a little glass tube like this, and very quickly the cat learned that what he had to do was take his paw, insert it into the tube, and then grasp in the way a cat can, rather different from our grasping, and then once it was firmly grasped, bring it to the mouth. And the interesting thing for me was not that Bro found particular pathways that linked uh, spinal cord with arm and hand, but when he found uh, a transection, a cut that blocked the neural control of the paw, within just four or five trials, the cat developed, a different cat, but never mind, the cat who had had this operation developed an adaptive behavior. Just four or five trials, no long, long-term learning and trial and error, he would reach in, uh, he couldn't grasp, so he just knocked the food out. And then, once it fell to the ground, he could grab it with his jaws. So very efficiently he found this. And so the, the model that we developed, so I'll just tell you and I won't flash the next few slides at you, uh, was we claimed that the mirror system, so even in cats, played a crucial role here that the, the cat thought he was doing, um, tried to do a, a grasp, but he failed. But in doing the grasp, he successfully battered the food out. So the claim is the mirror neurons were responding not to what he intended to do, but what it looked like he was doing. So the mirror neurons said, oh, you did a, a batting movement. And now a learning mechanism would say, hey, that batting movement was great because once the food was there, I mean, it didn't, the neurons don't talk like that, but <laughs> we, we, we had a model called temporal difference learning, which reached this idea that the cat, by having mirror neurons recognize that what he did was as if he was batting it out, reinforced batting, an action, another action in the repertoire that wasn't part of the, the, the normal behavior, and so over time, the mirror neurons were reporting both, hey, you failed at grasping, so don't even bother about grasping. On the other hand, you got food when you did the batting, and so make that. And so it just took a few trials by the combination of having mirror neurons available to monitor, did your action succeed? If, they didn't, if it didn't succeed, did something else succeed? Um, and coupling that with a learning algorithm to explain this rapid, rapid change. So this is just to give you a little flavor of how, um, on the one hand, neuroscientists develop new bodies of data for us, and how, on the other hand, as computational neuroscientists, we get in and we try to understand, well, let's not just be descriptive. What interactions between different parts of the brain, what mechanisms within different parts of the brain must have had to be involved to, to yield this range of different behaviors. Okay, so here's my slogan. Um, perhaps some of you will remember that um, Lewis Carroll not only wrote Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there, and John Tenniel, who illustrated the original books, had this lovely picture of uh, Alice going through the looking glass. And so this is my um, picture for this idea that mirror neurons are important, but if we want to understand their role in behavior, we have to understand these other systems beyond the mirror.
that we, we've now got a taste of the idea that we can't just say, here's a little bit of the brain, it's got mirror neurons and it's magic, it does the whole job for us. It's rather different parts of the brain work together to mediate any complex experience. And so as we go forward, we're not only trying to say, do mirror neurons play a role in empathy? Is empathy the key to architecture or aesthetics? But we're also saying, um, yeah, there are challenges for our understanding to think about how other brain regions get involved. I'm not going to go too far in that. I'm going to be more at the critique of reducing everything to mirror neurons than pushing us forward to, to, to other brain regions. But we'll, we'll see a little bit of that. So this picture is just to, to sort of make the point. We've got in the region F5, we've got mirror neurons, but we also have canonical neurons that are not involved in seeing what other people are doing. These work together to carry out movement, but as we saw by talking about the prefrontal cortex, um, did you want some more coffee? Did you remember whether there was coffee in the, in the mug and so on? That there's all the stuff beyond the mirror that's involved in interpretation, understanding, motivation, and planning to be able to mobilize the system in different circumstances. So in social interaction, this may be crucial in that I say not only am I monitoring my own actions, I'm monitoring the actions of others. This gives me understanding that I can factor in here to plan how I'm going to interact with that person. But I need these systems beyond the mirror to get things to work. Here's a very nice imaging study from um, Parma, uh, led by Buccino. Uh, back in 2004, but I really think this helps us. So, in one case, they presented movies um, of a person taking a bite of food, um, a monkey taking a bite of food, a dog taking a bite of food. And in each case, um, there was no soundtrack. But what we're seeing here is that if we look at, th this is the image of the human person observing, and the claim is that you're going to see whether you're looking at man or monkey or dog. Um, somehow you can map the act of biting onto your own body. And so the mirror system, one claims, is playing a crucial role in taking account of that behavior. Now over here, though, uh, again, no soundtrack. That's crucial. There's a video of a person talking of a monkey doing communicative mouth movements teeth chattering and lip smacking and so on, and a dog barking. And the idea is that you get this vigorous mirror system activity when looking at the human. When you see the monkey, you get a little bit, and none when you look at the dog. Now, why is that crucial to our argument? Well, you're saying that um, normally when you see um, a person, you, you, you can be sort of mapping their lip movements onto your vocal repertoire. When you see a monkey, okay, a monkey is sufficiently like you, you can get into it, but if a dog's barking, rah, 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 whatever, um, you don't normally map it on. And one regret I have is that they didn't change the task to saying, imitate the monkey, imitate the dog. And I think if it had been, then you would have been attending to the behavior in terms of mapping it onto your muscular activity. And then I think you would have got vigorous uh, activity. But I, I don't know if an experiment does that. But all I'm saying is, look, here is a familiar behavior, oral vocal behavior. Uh, you get vigorous mirror system activity here, a bit of mirror system activity here, and this for the dog. You recognize them all. You've got brain mechanisms that do it. So. I suppose, to, to put it rather cheaply. Um, would your mirror system be active when a dog, when a building is talking to you instead of a dog or a monkey? All right. So in other words, it may be that for this aesthetic experience and so on, in most cases, the mirror neurons aren't that important. It's those other regions of the brain beyond the mirror that may be playing the greater role. I said, if, if you're really looking at a building and getting a sense of, look at those caryatids holding the weight, and you can imagine yourself holding the weight, then you might get mirror system activity for that. If you're looking at this vast expanse, um, and it, in some sense, evokes the awesomeness of a mountain, then perhaps mirror neurons have nothing to do with it. That's the sort of um, discussion I'm using this to open up for us. So calibrating the claims for mirror neurons. When we appreciate art or architecture, does empathy 
in that sense the power of projecting one's personality into the object of contemplation really constitute um, fully comprehending the object and are mirror neurons truly the key to all this. I'm going to argue that mirror neurons may inform one's comprehension but don't in general provide the full account. So um, <coughs> what we, we looked at uh, in terms of the, the human monkey dog example was actions that are in repertoire do not exhaust the actions we may recognize uh, and then we noted canonical neurons are involved in performance as well and if you remember our original discussion of the dorsal how pathway and the ventral what pathway um, the dorsal pathways are linking to only a small part of the brain what about all that huge range of assessments and so on going through the dorsal regions so as we move forward to a neuroscience of empathy and aesthetics, uh, what do we do? Okay, let's talk a little bit about empathy. Um, this is a brain imaging study by um, Gazzola, Azizade, and Kaisers. Um, and here are sort of the various regions that are implicated, parietal, infratemporal, frontal. Um, and what in this case they're doing is they're having people uh, listen to sounds and seeing how active their mirror neurons are. In some sense, how well do they pick up on, in this case, auditory cues? And what this diagram purports to show is that if we look at three areas related to mirror system activity, and on this axis we, we sorry, on this axis we look at how much activation you get for uh, responding to the sounds of actions rather than just environmental sounds, and here you look at people taking a perspective-taking task, a measure of empathy. How well can they adopt the perspective of another as they observe various situations? Then there is a point for correlation. So if you like, here's, here's a claim that our ability to understand what others are doing is part of our ability to show empathy for them, but it's not, it's not the whole story. Okay. So... The next thing is going on to emotion, and uh, I, I'm just going to look very briefly at one, one basic data point. So, uh, whether we're talking about social interactions or we're talking about the, the, the way people are responding to the atmosphere of a building, we're saying it's not just in terms of those Gibsonian affordances, can I grab that object appropriately, but we're also talking about, if you like, emotional at, at, um, affordances, atmosphere. So. Uh, and we understand that human emotions are greatly influenced by our ability to em empathize with the behavior of other people. So what I'm going to start debating now is, is the Galazia account, that the way we feel other people's emotions um, or understand their actions is we simulate other people's actions as the basis for imitation and we simulate other people's feelings as the basis for empathy. So the idea is that we're, whether we're playing it out over our muscle system or playing it out over our emotional system, the, the neurons that both can take part in expressing our own action or our own emotion overlap with those that, that observe what's going on. So that's the claim. Um, so, so let's look at an example. So this is a famous study um, which used disgust. Uh, so they showed, um, you could either, I guess, give somebody some noxious odor and, and see how the brain lit up when they smelt this disgusting smell, or you could show them pictures of little videos of people experiencing this. And what they found was that there were areas of overlap. So the red is when um, people looked at the, um, smelt the, the disgusting thing, in other words, they were truly disgusted themselves. Uh, the blue was where they, they looked at somebody experiencing disgust, and the overlap is shown in white. Now, what I want to stress here is that, yes, there are some areas of overlap, which they call mirror neurons for this, emotional experience of disgust, but look at how much there is. So when 
Galatian Gattara in their chapter say the same brain areas are active as when we subjectively experience the emotional sensation. It's just not true. There's all that other activity in the brain and different activity depending on whether you yourself are experiencing the disgust or whether you're recognizing the disgust. And so again, the issue is what's going on. You know, what's going on in the brain of the building and what's going on in your brain. Yes. So let's look at this theory that uh, Vittorio Galezi in collaboration with others developed of putting neurons at the heart of social cognition and then of course our discussion here building on the, their chapter Galezi Mutara is to what extent is this a kind of social cognition helpful when we try to understand our experience of buildings. So they say one of the most striking features of our experience of others is its intuitive nature. We posit that mirror mechanisms allow us to directly understand the meaning of the actions and emotions of others by internally replicating or simulating them without any explicit reflective mediation. So that as you look at somebody's emotional state, or a building's emotional state, you look at somebody's action, and without any other process involved, your mirror neurons light up appropriately for the emotion or the action or whatever. Now, it seems to me this is not a very good account. Um, let's take the case, somebody comes up to you and they smile at you. Now, you register the smile immediately, but the important thing is that if that person is a friend or a stranger, you'll probably smile back. If it's somebody who you think of as um, an enemy or not trustworthy and they smile at you, you think, what's the bastard smiling at? And you don't smile back. So that there might be, who knows, a quarter of a second in which the mirror neurons might twitch slightly that this is a smile. But the important thing about your reaction, and I would say the same thing about getting the atmosphere of the building, is there is an integration time of give it a few seconds, if you will, to, to put it together. So um, direct experiential grasp of the mind of others, I think, is, is a mistake in thinking about um, how we register the emotion of others. So I'm going to do an experiment with you. And um, I'll then analyze your reaction. So here's the suggestion that mirror neurons simulate other people's feelings as the basis for empathy based on recognizing facial expressions, recognizing the intentions of others. Um, so let's do this experiment. Now what you're going to see is in the real experiment, you'd see a video. Well, what I'm going to do is just show you three slides. I want you to read the slides down from top to bottom to simulate watching a video. And we're going to test the mirror neuron simulation theory, which I think would be that you see the emotion of the person as expressed in the video. And the question will be, to what extent do you have a, at least a moment of reacting the same way that person is apparently reacting in the video? All right, in, in this group, the live group, how many of you had a at least a momentary twitching of your lips and a smile when you saw that. Okay, so most people did that. So most of you might say, okay, this sort of convinces me um, that the mirror neuron theory simulation of emotion and so on is appropriate. I, I'm in some sense being infected by that smile as I recognize that smile. Right? But now I'm going to give you a scenario where um, you don't just, here's a little video out of sequence, you, you're in a real life situation. So I want you to imagine the following. You've spent the day cooking a superb dinner. Like you really put your heart into it, you've really produced this, this wonderful dish. Um, you worked hard because you really want to please your guests. You chose a very special and expensive wine to complement it. All right, so just imagine that. You've, you, you've just poured a glass of wine, your guest has picked it up, you've worked all day to produce this beautiful dinner, you spent a hundred bucks on this bottle of wine, which you thought would perfectly complement the dinner, and now watch the video. <laughs> now it's interesting that 
nobody registers the disgust that he's registering. People in an audience laugh, but if it really happened to you, your mood would be anger, not disgust. So it's that need to really take into account the, the way in which context comes in. In some ways, if you think about many buildings, uh, the outside is setting a context for the interior spaces. And so it, the architect is not merely thinking of, okay, if I sort of magically beamed this person into this room, what effect would it have? It's I've, I've walked up the steps of this building, I've walked down this corridor, the doors part, and now I see this space. How am I going to react? So in some sense, that story of, it's not just throw me in the middle of something, let me register the initial moment. It's in a different state of preparation. How do I register the atmosphere or the, the practicality, as the case may be, of the space? Okay. So, Mulgrave asks, how can mirror neurons elicit emotional and other reactions from rooms or buildings? How does architecture transform the emotional palette engendered by interaction with conspecifics? Is my way of asking it. We've got the, the, the mirror neurons that can register the emotional state of others. How do we get to a brain where, A, just in talking about social interaction, we really take account of the way context changes our emotional reaction to the emotions of others? And B, to what extent could that system we come up with to explain our interaction with conspecifics with people we know as fellow humans, how can that transfer to buildings? Um, so I'm saying there's a real question, I think, of to what extent could person-person empathy support person-building empathy? And, and I, I'm particularly interested in this because as I say, in the end, if we're going to have really successful interaction between neuroscience and architecture, the architect has to ask the neuroscientist an interesting question. It can't just be, oh, you've just come up with some experiments, I'm going to sort of have a pop science interpretation of them and plug them into my, my chatter about architecture. In the end, we want really serious, how can I better understand what's going on in the brain, challenge the neuroscientist, how can I get new ways of thinking about the, the design of a building or the way in which that building will impact people. So I think this question of taking this, this notion of empathy and mirror neurons that's being pushed by Mulgrave and Galezi and Gattara, not, not just simply saying, oh, they should have been thinking about beyond the mirror, but saying, okay, how could a deeper neuroscience analysis challenge the neuroscientist? How could that deeper analysis then factor back to extend the insights they've tried to give us uh, in the two chapters we're talking about. So I think I'm going to jump over a couple of slides and just get into talking about aesthetics. Um, I, I had a lot of misunderstanding of the Galazian guitar chapter because I think of aesthetics in the sense that the primary definition in the Oxford English Dictionary gives. It's the philosophy of the beautiful or of art, a system of principles for the appreciation of the beautiful, the distinctive underlying principles of a work of art or a genre, the work of an artist, the arts of a culture. So in other words, you might say what makes an atmosphere successful? Uh, what makes a, a building or, 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 or an artwork beautiful? Whereas it turned out that Galazian guitar for aesthetics, it was just, well, you know, what sort of feeling do you get from it? What sort of perceptual impact do you get? And so the crucial point where, where Galazi and I agree is that perception is not just a come in through the sensory portal of vision or even the sensory portals of vision and audition. It's bound up with action and that you really have to in, engage in that I mean, this is why we emphasize affordances a lot. We're not really looking at things purely in terms of their abstract pattern in general. In architecture, perhaps we are in certain artworks, but in, in architecture, we're really looking at the, the perception. Well, we're trying to understand the aesthetic, in my sense, or the Oxford English Dictionary sense, and the, 
the, the, the, the affordances that are, that are given to us. So, as I say, for, for certainly for Galesian Gatara, not so sure about Mulgrave, it refers to an early component of our perceptual experience of the object, to what is happening before any explicit judgment is formulated. The neurophysiological and behavioral evidence of this early phase of aesthetic experience is strikingly similar to that which underlies the mundane perception, perceptual experience of non-artistic objects. And this was sort of where I got really worried reading the chapter because since for me, I want to understand, and I think for, for architects, I want to understand the aesthetics as that special experience. Um, if you say, well, I'm not really concerned about the difference between, uh, hey, that's a building, and gee, that's a masterpiece, then why are we having the discussion? So um, although that chapter is written in terms of this mundane view of aesthetics, I'm going to critique it because I want to move us forward rather than just tell you about what an existing paper says. I want to move it forward in terms of, yes, well, if we took aesthetics in the, in the what I would call the, the real sense, but anyway, the Oxford English Dictionary sense and my the way I use the word, um, what happens when we look at what they say with that criterion in mind? That's going to be the approach. So, here's their statement. And as I say, my main concern is that a striking similarity does nothing to explain the nature of aesthetic judgment. Because I, I had a correspondence with, with Alessandro Gattara, and he says it's important to distinguish between aesthetic experience, which is sort of the everyday, you know, what is it, what do I see, uh, or what do I feel, and aesthetic judgments, hey, is this beautiful, is this disgusting, or what have you. So the aesthetic experience consists, they say, of activating embodied simulation of actions, emotions, and corporeal sensations. Uh, and as we go along, I'm going to wonder, maybe they're overemphasizing the motoric. So I talked about the awe-inspiring nature of a, a building, which may be tapping into our perception of mountains and so on. And there, I think the motoric experience is not what's important. It's our perception of our relationship with that mass that's important. OK, let's see what happens. So let's, before I start with the first example, um, look at Mulgrave, who, who was influenced in this discussion by, by Galesi. Um, talking about the precognitive activation of embodied mirror mechanisms, the simulation of actions, emotions, and corporeal sensation. Now, that's sort of interesting because, as we said, um, we might have mirror neurons responding to actions and emotions, but they don't respond to corporeal sensations unless they're tied up with action and emotion. So, he's going to ask us to consider figurative works of art. So we. We're not really going to see much, I think there's one architecture slide in the rest of the lecture. So it's mainly works of art. But consider figurative works of art in which we form some powerful emotional or empathic attachment, such as the sculpture of Lea Kuan and his sons being murdered by the wrath of Athena. I think that's the next slide. But they also argue, now this is interesting, that um, Galassi and Co. Are, are really pushing this idea of I'm reading the the work of art in motor terms in two different ways. And I don't think in the chapter they ever really comment explicitly on the fact that these are two very different ways and that there's a challenge then of bringing them together. So one way is I see, let's say, human figures struggling and maybe my mirror neurons are responding to that struggle. But the other is I see traces of the work of the artist and I respond to, in some sense, the work of the artist. And I mentioned earlier my concern then with a forgery, which is so successful that at the level of brush strokes, it may be different, and yet it still has the same impact on us. So there's a case where whatever the emotional impact or the atmosphere is, it's not, in fact, based on the work of the artist. So let, let's look at the first example of this um, and carry it forward. So here is a photo of the Lea Kuan. And uh, let's just think about this. So here... The, the emotional impact of this is very much in terms of seeing the, both the anguished expression on the faces and seeing the, the posture of the body. And then maybe as you pursue it further, 
um, you recognize the serpent as being the source of the struggle and maybe that enriches you and now you're going perhaps beyond the mirror neurons because you're the fear of snakes um, is probably a, an innate part of our emotional repertoire rather than something that requires recognizing what's going on. Um, so the first comment is, notice in this case, the skill of the sculptor is that there's no visible trace of his creative gestures. Right? I mean, this is so smoothly done, you look at it, and you might sort of focus in, you might stop attending to this and just start attending to the texture and say, wow, that's a really incredible, incredibly skillful work. But that's, that's totally different from the conveyance of this. And then the other idea I had was, just imagine that you put this in a different context, where there are sort of a, a Christmas tree at the side and a bunch of open boxes, and you replace the snake with ribbons. And these guys are struggling with the wrapping of the Christmas presents. And suddenly it goes from being this engrossing struggle to, um, you know, kitsch and uh, maybe slightly amusing. So, again, this idea that, yeah, the, the, the mirror neurons, when actions of the protagonist or emotional expression of the protagonist is crucial to the work, yeah, the mirror neurons can be part of that larger system that leads to one's appreciation of the whole. But context can matter. Now, here is Mulgrave's example. He talks about this uh, Assyrian warrior in the British Museum, and he says, we study the delicate chisel marks that create the composition. We admire the intricacy and detail of the author's hand, the skill that's always present in a great work of art. We are simulating our own hand carrying out this work. Well, we may wonder why this Assyrian has a a wristwatch, but um, you know, for some of this is a matter of we're much more out of the realm, I think, of pre attentive mirror neuron activity and into a realm of, of conscious connoisseurship. I mean, many of us will just stand in front of that, um, we won't look at the chisel marks, we'll, we'll just get a sense of this unusual figure and how he's garbed, and we, we've learnt a very non mirror neuron thing that it's several thousand years old. and that is the complex that gives us our artistic experience. For Harry, stepping up close, and looking at that, that enriches it, but it's, a, it's definitely not a flash of the mirror neurons type experience. The mirror neurons may be involved within this larger process of connoisseurship of someone who wants to try and see as much as he or she can of the work of the artist, but it's it's that larger system we need to understand. And so, in a sense, again, with the, with the architect designing a building, you're thinking about who are the inhabitants, the users, the agents going to be as they move through this building, as they interact in this building, as they use the building. What is it they're going to attend to? Uh, what don't they attend to? It's fascinating uh, when you, having recently had my house remodeled, you, you, you get all these horrible odds and ends in the walls as they're being built, and then this guy comes on and slathers the, the stuff on and you get a nice smooth surface. The whole point is you don't want to see what the, what the construction is. Okay, but let's, let's turn to examples where we get into construction. Just, just one example um, from the mirror neuron literature before I go. Aliotti um, and his colleagues did uh, studies, both behavioral and brain imaging, of people watching videos of throws. And what was interesting is that they had three populations, um, fans, sports commentators, and the star baseball players themselves. And what they found was that um, the mirror neuron activity was pretty well established in all three populations, but if you just showed the first part of the video clip, the athletes could tell you whether the ball would go in or not. Neither the commentators nor the, the fans could tell you. So after all, the commentator's job is not to say, this is the first half second of the throw, I think it's going to succeed, but to say either it did or did not succeed. 
So they hadn't built this. So, and what they found was that many other areas of the brain were engaged along with the, the mirror neuron activity. So this idea of how are you using that information? What are your skill level? What parts of the brain do you recruit to do what you've got to do? Recognizing a successful throw is different from judging whether a throw will be successful and therefore preparing yourself to take appropriate action on whether you think there's no point in my running, that's going to go in versus, hey, I've got to intercept it. And they did another study with um, soccer players, football players, and found that the, the goalkeeper had a very different brain activity in responding to videos from that which other players on the team would have because his behavioral repertoire was so different. So I, I think that fits in with that idea of who are you designing for? And if you're designing for multiple people, how do you constrain yourself with respect to those diverse audiences? Okay, here's a quote from Mulgrave. He shows us this picture and he wants to bring in the story of, of mirror neurons and he's concentrating on the tension of these columns. So a twisted column might induce a state of tension within our bodies as our mirror systems viscerally simulate the twisting of the column. Here such simulation can be read both symbolically and emotionally. Now that's interesting. So already he's getting us beyond the mirror, beyond the crude reductionism of mirror neurons because he's saying that you know, on the one hand he's appealing to the mirror neurons to get a, a sense of the tension of the twisting of the column, but symbolically he's getting um, the load of the heavy vaults, that's carrying us back to Schopenhauer, but we're also getting the tense gesture fitting in a chapel that was designed specifically to house the ritual sacrifice of Christ. So now you're seeing an interaction between your, the, the, the person's awareness of the Christian tradition and the symbolism of that tradition and the, the claimed emotional activity. So again, there's our challenge to, to bring together the, as it were, the subconscious motor engagement with the, with the building and the thing. But I, I want to just look at this claim that when you see a twisting shape like this, you immediately have this sense of tension. And I claim when you see the, the yarn like that, it's softness, it's a totally different thing. So the twisting is in this case trumped by the context. Hey, it's, it's wool versus hey, it's a column in a chapel. So again, we're looking at that interaction. Okay, so we're now um, just facing this idea that I put, where does embodied simulation leave off and symbolism take over? So here's Galazi Guitar again, the experience of architecture from the contemplation of the decorative element of a Greek temple to the physical experience of living and working within a specific architectonic space can be deconstructed into its grounding bodily elements. Cognitive neuroscience can investigate of what the sense of presence that some buildings possess is made. This approach can also contribute a fresher empirical take on the evolution of architectonic style and its cultural diversity by treating it as a particular case of symbolic expression and through identifying its bodily So in fact, we're seeing here that uh, although they're selling, hey, the mirror neurons made me do it or made me feel it, um, once we allow ourselves this sentence, we're getting into this place where cultural diversity may supersede the, the commonality of human embodiment. Okay. So now we're on the home stretch. Um, they did some EEG studies um, and, and some behavioral studies where they had people look at things um, and showed that the perception uh, engaged a possibly subliminal motor component. So they, had, uh, they looked at brain behavior as people looked at a letter of the Roman alphabet, a Chinese ideogram or a meaningless scribble, all written by hand, and they found that these activated the hand motor representation of the beholder. So, so yeah, there's no argument here that we really as our emphasis on affordances is done, um, we really have to be taking in the motor component of perception as we try to analyze the impact of a building on people when they see it for the first time, building an atmosphere, and when they experience it, use it, and so on. Let's consider these two examples, though, they put up for us. Um, here's Lucio Fontana's spatial concept number two. 
here's Franz Klein's uh, Chief 1950, and what they're claiming is that they showed a similar motor simulation of hand gestures is about when beholding a cut on canvas by Lucio Fontana or the dynamic brush strokes on canvas by Franz Klein. Interesting, but uh, I recently had the pleasure of seeing a Fontana at uh, an exhibition on modern masters from Latin America at the San Diego Museum of Art. And when you have the chance to get up close and personal, you find these aren't cuts at all. That this is a, a sort of two and a half D uh, canvas with the depressions carefully molded in and then the black applied to highlight those regions. So in fact, uh, in this case, they were basing their claim for the appreciation of Fontana on the act of slashing. But if you really want to take the act of construction, what the artist did into account, you may want to argue that it appears like a slash, and that's part of it, but the actual act of the artist was not a slash or a cut. So that's interesting, I think. And then let's look at um, this example of Klein. And I think here, well, I, I haven't learned to appreciate Klein's work yet. I, I, I enjoyed the Fontana when I could see the real thing. Maybe if I saw the real thing here, I'd learn to love it, but not yet. But this is one, I think, in which the brush strokes, these bold brush strokes, are made manifest. And if you're going to appreciate the work, it's because you appreciate that, that you can, in some sense, reconstruct from the static result of the brush strokes the dynamics of creating them. But, but, let's return to this question of, yeah, if your aesthetics is just the, the, the sort of glazing guitar level of how do you perceive uh, in an everyday sense what the work is, and we emphasize bringing in the motor work. But let, let's go to the, to the other end of how do you appreciate a great work of art. And knowing that there are these motor correlates has nothing to do with it. And so here's my, my example. Let's consider this bold brushwork um, on the Mona Lisa when you visit the Louvre. Uh, aesthetically, glazing guitar, this is fine, right? You get the motor work, the motor brushwork. Um, aesthetically, in terms of your notion of the beautiful, well, maybe a few of you will in fact say, no, I really think that's an improvement. Why didn't Leonardo think of it? But for most of this is an act of desecration rather than a work of artistic accomplishment. So, as I've tried to, to reiterate again and again, I'm not trying to say we should ignore what Mulgrave and Galatian Guitara are saying, but rather to try and place it in a broader context, both one that leads us into, but what happens when we consider aesthetics in the sense of the beautiful, and the other, what happens when we do think about systems beyond the mirror and try to, to place um, our experience of art or architecture in context in relation to the idea of the mirror neuron in context. And so my final, final slide is to show you these two. Uh, one, a Japanese work of art, and one, a photograph of a guy in Fort Lauderdale, both doing the same thing, and presumably evoking in you the same mirror neuron activity of struggling with a crocodile. But your judgment of which is a work of art and which isn't is unaffected by the similar activity of your mirror neurons. And so on that spirit of let's revisit this notion of empathy, mirror neurons and the experience of architecture, not in terms of closing it in terms of the two readings we've discussed today, but in terms of opening up to future research.